Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Applying Ethology webinar. I am Laura Whalen, a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, and I've been working with Christian Narok, Jenyan Chow, and Rachel Park to organize these webinars. As we begin today, I want to remind you all to please turn off your camera and your microphone. Should you have questions for our speaker, please type them in the chat box and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Today, Andrea Polanco, a PhD candidate in animal behavior and welfare at the University of Health in Canada, will share what abnormal behavior can teach us about captive animals' quality of life. Andrea studies stereotypic and self-injurious behavior and depressive-like inactivity in laboratory rhesus macaques. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Laura. Um, if I do happen to disconnect, please just give me a few minutes and I'll come back. Um, hopefully that won't happen, but just in case. Um, so yeah, today I'll discuss some of my PhD research that looks at whether abnormal behaviors can be used as indicators of lifetime welfare in laboratory rhesus monkeys. So I'd just like to first mention that the results I'm sharing today have yet to be seen by my advisory committee, and they've also not been for peer review, so just something to keep in mind. Um, so before I get into lifetime welfare, I'd just like to clarify what I mean by welfare first. So myself, the lab, and the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare typically mean effective states when we talk about welfare. So keeping that in mind, lifetime welfare is the sum of all positive and negative experiences in an individual's lifetime. So starting with human primate data, there is evidence that the number of stressful life events, examples being job loss, death of a family member, divorce, assault, et cetera, are associated with a reduction in life satisfaction life satisfaction and associated with an increase in depressive symptoms. In addition to the frequency of stressful life events, other work also finds that the appraisal of the event is important for mental health. So negative appraisals, but not positive appraisals of life events are associated with a reduction in perceived quality of life and an increase in depression. But what about other species? Regulatory bodies often now call for lifetime welfare to be evaluated, especially for laboratory animals who are repeatedly reused in different studies. But what makes an event positive or negative in other species? I'll go into this a bit more in the next, in the next slide, but for now, positive experiences are those that are preferred or promote fitness, and negative experiences are those that are not preferred and or reduce fitness. So lifetime welfare is particularly relevant to concepts like lives worth living and quality of life. So the whole purpose of assessing lifetime welfare is to make a judgment about whether an animal still has a life worth living or should be retired or euthanized instead. And this is actually reflected in European legislation for laboratory animals. So they say that the benefit of reusing animals should be balanced against any adverse effects on their welfare, taking into account the lifetime experience of the individual animal. They also say for non-human primates that they should have a personal history file from birth covering their lifetimes in order to be able to receive the care accommodation and treatment that meet their individual needs and characteristics. So for any welfare indicator to be validated, it needs to show construct validity. So does the indicator measure what it claims to be measuring? And one way to assess this is to see if the indicator changes in one direction if you expose animals to more positive experiences. And this assumes that these stimuli are accompanied by positive affect. Secondly, you can see if the indicator there changes in the opposite direction if you expose animals to more negative experiences. So stimuli that would decrease their evolutionary fitness or that they would avoid. And this assumes that these stimuli are accompanied by negative affect. And lastly, you can see if the indicator similarly varies in people reporting negative or positive emotions. And this assumes homology between people and other animals, which is generally an acceptable assumption, especially in biomedical research since non-human primates are often used as models for humans. So ideally you want welfare indicators that are not prone to false positives or false negatives. So false positives are also known as false alarms. And this might be when a negative, negative welfare indicator increases during positive or neutral emotional states. And then this then mistakenly indicates poor welfare. So on the graph, um, this is what a false positive would look like. So being high even after a few negative experiences. False negatives are also called misses. So this would be when a negative welfare indicator decreases during negative emotional states, so it goes in the opposite direction, or it doesn't change at all. So therefore you would miss cases of poor welfare 
And on the graph, this is what a negative, sorry, this is what a false negative would look like. So having low levels, um, even after an animal has had many negative experiences. So in line with this validation framework, are there any potential indicators of lifespan welfare? So there are potential biomarkers like hippocampal volume and telomere length, but these are haven't been fully validated and they're invasive, so they require sedation and restraint, which is extremely aversive. So we were more interested in finding practical indicators like abnormal behaviors that can be stored in the home cage. And these include stereotypic behaviors, which are repetitive activities caused by motivational frustration or brain dysfunction. So in non-human primates, a subcategory of stereotypic behaviors is typically called motor. And this is not a validated subcategory, but people do use it because it seems intuitive to group them together. So in monkeys, this would include full body movements like pacing, bouncing, swinging, rocking, twirling. Um, also, this video is not an endorsement of the group, just FYI. Um, and there is some evidence that motor search with behaviors are valid indicators of lifetime welfare. So for example, uh, repeated rewarding experiences predict fewer motor serotonin behaviors in lab monkeys, including being mother reared, especially outdoors, and just having more time spent in outdoors in general. And repeated aversive experiences predict more motor serotonin behaviors in laboratory monkeys, like the number of location moves, number of research project, and years spent single cows. Another type of stereotypic behavior is hair plucking, which is self-directed hair removal by pulling with the teeth or hands, often seen with a quick jerking motion. So in this video, um, you can see that the monkey is hair plucking with their teeth. And you can also notice other hair loss spots where they probably pluck as well. So hair plucking hasn't been researched to the same extent as motor stereotypic behavior, but existing work finds that the length of single housing increases the odds of showing it. And moving indoor single house animals uh, outdoors, either alone or with others, reduces the rate of hair plucking. So here on the y-axis, you see the number of self-directed incidents per hour um, when they were indoor housed and then afterwards when they were moved outdoor, although this study did pool hair plucking with other self-directed search behaviors. And finally, natural group size also uh, just defined as troop size in the wild. So this is positively correlated with time spent hair plucking in zoo primates. So these researchers hypothesize that hair plucking could possibly be a frustrated motivation to groom others. So similar results to stereotypic behaviors being affected by long term experiences in lab monkeys have been found in other captive animals. So for example, in zoo elephants, stereotypic behaviors become more time consuming as time spent alone increases. And this is uh, worse for Asian elephants, as you can see in the graph. And stereotypic behaviors are also higher in infants who've been repeatedly moved between zoos, again, affecting Asian elephants more. So enrichment typically protects against the development of stereotypic behavior across many different species in captivity. Um, and deer mice, for example, an enriched cage can look like something in the photo I have here. And again, this typically protects against stereotypic behavior. So in the graph, um, age on the ax age is on the x-axis and levels of stereotypic behavior is on the y-axis. And you see that um, as animals age, uh, levels of stereotypic behavior go up, but this is only seen for standard housed mice, so standard housed mice, which is uh, the baseline at the top, but this does not occur in enriched housed animals, which is the bottom line, of, bottom black line. Uh, however, if enriched housed animals experience 12 hours of isolation per week in a chamber, um, like in the photo that just appeared, then the protective effect of enrichment vanishes. So you see that in the graph, uh, enriched house animals develop similar levels to standard house animals. So for this current study, uh, we hypothesize that stereotypic behaviors are valid lifetime welfare indicators. Um, and there are three predictions with this. So the first being that a lifetime welfare score or the sum of life events should show a positive association with stereotypic uh, the second being that individual negative life events should show positive associations with stereotypic behaviors, while individual positive events uh, should show negative associations. And lastly, uh, model fit should be improved when all life events are added together compared to models just account for 
demographics neutral to welfare being age, sex, and facility. So all three predictions are required to meet this hypothesis. So for the study, I observed 279 indoor house foods and macaques from two US primate facilities with similar numbers at each. Uh, facility A did have more monkeys that were singled house than facility B. And for paired house animals, there were some times when the grate between the cages were closed to keep animals apart. So uh, current social status was calculated as a proportion of observations uh, single, just for analyses. And this sample uh, was more, more than half were female and there was a mean age of 9.67 years, ranging from one years of age to almost 30. And animals were selected opportunistically based on project status and weekly room availability. So for behavioral observations, they were live recorded from video cameras that were stationed in front of two adjacent cages at a time. So I was able to access live video feed outside the room to reduce observer effects. I was blind to prior life experiences, but it was not possible for me to be blind uh, to current cage dynamics of whether an animal was single housed or paired housed, whether they were top or bottom uh, back, and whether how close the cage was to the door. So I observed five rooms at each facility, and after one day of camera habituation, behavioral data was collected for five uh, or five, four or five consecutive days per room at each facility. Uh, all subjects were observed across two observational periods, um, approximately two hours before afternoon feeding and approximately two hours after afternoon feeding. And scanning took place approximately every five minutes during each observational period, and I used focal sampling for certificate behaviors. So for the ephogram, I have previous work that looked at the convergent validity of the motor stereotypic behavior subcategory, as well as the subcategory called self-directed stereotypic behaviors, which are often used in the monkey literature. Um, so with convergent validity, we expect behaviors in the same subcategory to be similar to one another. So therefore we expect them to be comorbid or to co-occur. But um, our work has actually found that neither of these two categories show convergent validity. So the subcategories were actually formed of heterogeneous behaviors, meaning that the behaviors weren't actually co-occurring. So we then created new valid subcategories that were made up of behaviors that do uh, positively co-vary. So this includes for subcategory of rocking, swinging, bouncing, twirling, and hanging. However, in this sample that I observed, I did not see hanging. So the analysis are just going to be focused on rocking, swinging, bouncing, and twirling. Oh, and these stereotypic behaviors had to be repeated at least three times in about two counts. The other subcategory was validated. Uh, this included pacing and head twisting, but head twisting was only seen in one monkey, and the monkey performed this behavior very rarely. Therefore, the analysis just focused on pacing. And lastly, our previous work that's currently under review only found hair plucking, um, it actually found hair plucking to not positively co-vary with any other abnormal behavior. So we categorized it alone. And this was seen um, in approximately 45% of the monkeys. So moving on to life events, the events chosen for this study were pre-established to be good or bad for welfare by using the validation criterion that I presented earlier. So I basically looked at the literature and saw how the events affect welfare in humans, as well as whether they're preferred or not preferred in monkeys, and if they were promote or reduce their fitness in the wild. So positive welfare related events include being separated from the mother after two years of age, being out of mother reared, spending time outdoors, and spending time with another monkey if indoor housed. Negative life events included having an early uh, separation age from the mother, being indoor reared, spending time indoors, spending time single housed, um, having a high count of location moves, health events, uh, research projects, spending time in the hospital, as well as current cage position is important as prior work has found that being at the bottom level of a cage and closer to the door to be aversive. So, the life event records were extracted from each center's digital management system. So after obtaining the raw data, variables were generated by running queries to obtain either a count or a duration from date of birth up until the first day of behavioral data collection. So this was done for time spent single versus paired, time spent indoors versus outdoors, time spent in the hospital, as well as the number of location moves, number of projects, and number of health events. 
Uh, so early life experiences were obtained differently. So the age monkeys were separated from their moms was inferred by a change in location that was different from the dam. So age of maternal separation was categorized into four ordinal bins between under six months of age to over two years of age. Rearing was categorized based on where monkeys spent uh, 75% of their first six months of life. So this was just using a criteria that I by another study. So in facility A, this included being outdoor mother reared in either a large or a small troop, um, being indoor mother reared or being reared without a mother. In facility B, this included outdoor mother reared in a large uh, or a medium or a small troop, as well as being indoor mother reared. So we did calculate lifetime welfare score in this study following the human literature. Um, so we took the sum of life events, but we standardized each event first. And we did this, um, so we standardized life events between zero to one. One is the most aversive experience and zero is the least aversive. So continuous variables were standardized by dividing them by their maximum value. And since time spent outdoors versus indoors and time spent paired versus single were the reciprocals of each other, I just only included indoor housing and single housing um, in this composite score. And for categorical variables like free ring and general separation age, each level was given a score between zero to one. So after standardizing each event, they were then added together to create a overall lifetime welfare score where a higher value indicates more cumulative suffering. Uh, one major limitation of this composite score is that it assumes each life event carries the same way, same weight in affecting welfare. And this is highly unlikely since it's more likely that each event's gonna vary in severity. And I'll come back to that later. So it's not a perfect score, but it is practical. Um, for the analyses, monkeys were excluded if they moved cages halfway through, um, this was, or if their rearing history could not be categorized, either because they had a mix of rearing types or because they were not born at the facility. So my final sample size for analyses is 255 monkeys. So to test production number one, a mixed logistic model was run with the outcome of being stereotypical behavior in binomial format, so presence or absence for each scan. So the model is predicting the odds of stereotypic behavior being detected in a scan. So we chose to do this type of model instead of a linear model because time budgets of stereotypic behaviors, um, they were quite low. And so um, because of that, they were unlikely to meet the model assumptions of normality and heterogeneity. So I ran separate models for pacing, hair plucking, and the rocking subcategory. And predictor variables included the composite score of welfare, lifetime welfare facility, the interaction between them, as well as controlling for sex and age and total activity time budget. So I controlled for sex and age because prior studies have found um, differences regarding age and sex for purport, performing stereotypic behaviors and for activity levels. It's possible that an increase in stereotypic behavior can just be an artifact of increased activity. However, this isn't as certain as the confound for sex and age. So models were run with and without total activity to see if stereotypic behaviors were sensitive to the lifetime welfare score, depending if total activity was accounted for. And I had random effects where animal ID was nested in cage, nested in room. So to test prediction number two, another mixed logistic model was run with the same outcome variables, but here I used a typical uh, epidemiological model building procedure. So predictor variables here are removed if they show no variation, if they're collinear with another variable, if they show a non-significant univariable association with the outcome, or if they're not significant um, in a multivariable model. So predictor variables included all life events of interest in addition to sex, age, facility, and again, running the models with and without activity time budget. Although for today, I've only gotten a chance to run the models with total activity included. I also assessed for all possible interactions between life events and sex and time since single house because prior studies have found worse welfare among males, indoor ear monkeys, and single house monkeys when experiencing other laboratory events. And I also looked at all possible interactions with facility because prior work has demonstrated facility differences for the prevalence of abnormal behaviors and facilities also differ in research use, which may differentially impact welfare. So I used Ikeiki information criterion to test prediction number three. Um, so 
AIC is often used as a value for model fit where a smaller value means better model fit. So I compared the AIC of the model with the demographics and shows welfare being sex, age, and facility to the AIC of the model with all these variables plus the welfare relevant. Uh, so the model with the life events should have better model fit according to the hypothesis. So just before going into the results of those models, uh, just a few descriptive statistics. So overall, the average time budgets of each certificator were low. So a monkey spent an average of 2% of their time or less performing them. Um, and this is also why the data was modeled as binomial, so present or absent for each scan, because again, these time budgets are going to be largely skewed to zero. So those lifetime welfare score predict stereotypic behaviors. Um, yes, so I, we found that a unit increase in lifetime welfare score significantly increases the odds of hair plucking by 1.65, the odds of pacing by 3.35 and the odds of the rotten subcategory by 3.14. And this was controlling for sex, age, and total activity, and you get the same results. Actually, hold on. Uh, if you do remove total activity, then the ORs become weaker, so they become smaller. And, and this suggests that stereotypic behaviors are a more sensitive measure of lifetime welfare score when you control for total activity. So overall, these results mean that more cumulative suffering is correlated with higher odds of seeing stereotypic behaviors. But do negative life events predict uh, stereotypic behaviors and are positive events protective? It's a bit complicated. So um, for the rockings category, only one life event made it to the final risk factor model uh, controlling sex age facility and total activity time budget. So uh, yeah, so here you see that current time spent single house during observation increases the odds of this subcategory. So time spent active was also significant, increasing the odds of showing these stereotypic behaviors. For pacing, only past time spent outdoors was significant in the final risk factor model, so it reduced the odds of pacing. And again, time spent active was also significant, um, increasing the odds of pacing. And this time I found a significant effect of facility where the odds of pacing were significantly higher in one facility versus the other. There are many results for hair plucking. So first there was a significant mean effect cage distance. Um, the, farther, the farther monkeys were from the door, the more likely they were to hair pluck, but this was actually the opposite of what was predicted. So literature suggests that being closer to the door is aversive. And there were four significant interactions for hair plucking. So three of them involved current single housing where the proportion of observation spent single increased the odds of hair plucking, especially for monkeys who were separated from their mother under six months of age. If monkeys experienced four more projects in the past and if they were very active in general, so spending 80% of more of their time active. And the last interaction was between sex and wearing. So being outdoor reared versus indoor reared did not affect females' odds of showing hair plucking, but males who were outdoor reared in a large group had significantly lower odds of hair plucking versus indoor reared males. And there was no significant difference between males outdoor reared in a smaller median group versus indoor. So this suggests that males are protected from developing hair plucking later in life only if they've been reared in a large outdoor group. So overall, these risk factor models differ from the results of the composite score of lifetime welfare that shows that the score positively predicts stereotypic behaviors. So to kind of understand the discrepancy in results, um, I did look at the direction of the relationship between each life event and all stereotypic behaviors tested in univariable models. So these univariable models aren't controlling for anything and they're just the main effect of the life event. So here I have the direction of the relationship, so positive or negative. And for hair plucking and the rocking subcategory, um, many life events had effects in the predicted direction. They just weren't significant, but there are a couple exceptions um, highlighted in uh, red. So for some stereotypic behaviors, we see that some life events are actually predicting the behavior in the opposite direction than what was predicted. So for example, uh, number of life events, sorry, number of location moves is negatively correlated with pacing and rocking subcategory, meaning that more location moves is correlated with less pacing and less 
uh, rocking, swinging, bouncing, twirling. So this is an example of a false negative. So pacing seems to show many false negatives, more so than hair plucking and the rocking subcategory. So the last prediction, um, does model fit improve when adding all life events to the model with just demographic variables? And it does for hair plucking, but it doesn't for the other sorts of behaviors. So uh, only hair plucking showed improved model fit when adding all life events to the model, while the pacing and rocking subcategory showed worse model fit after adding all life events. So this just means that the sum of life events isn't a good fit for pacing and the rocking subcategory. And you also get the same results when adding total activity to the model. So putting it all together, um, again, like Malfoy score does positively predict stereotypic behaviors. Um, intensively, that suggests that more cumulative suffering is correlated with higher odds of developing stereotypic behaviors. However, the risk factor models only showed significant effects of some life events, not all of them. And then the direction of the relationships between the life events and stereotypic behaviors did show evidence of false negatives or misses for all stereotypic behaviors, especially for pacing. As well, there was evidence of worse model fit when looking at the sum of life events versus just demographic variables, um, particularly for the pacing and the rocking subcategories. So, for pacing, the hypothesis was therefore rejected since not all three predictions were met. So again, um, pacing was not predicted by most life events in the expected direction. It had many uh, false negatives as well. Model fit, again, worsened for pacing after adding all life events to the model. So pacing in the end only seemed to have reflect the life event of spending more time indoors. So monkeys were less likely to pace if they had a previous history of outdoor housing. For the rocking subcategory, uh, the hypothesis was rejected, again, since not all three predictions were met. So again, not predicted by most life events in the expected direction, and model fit worsened um, after adding all life events to the model. And for this subcategory from the risk factor models, it really only seems to reflect current single housing. Hair plucking, however, does show some potential. Um, so it was predicted by most life events in the expected direction, although it did have two false negatives. And model fit did improve after adding all life events to the model. So there, there's definitely potential for hair plucking, um, which is important because 45% um, of the monkeys in the sample did perform hair plucking at some point. So it could just, so there's definitely a lot of potential for this. So although prior work does show stereotypic behaviors to indicate poor welfare, our study found that they're not reflective of lifetime welfare. But again, um, if you do see animals performing stereotypic behaviors, take it seriously. But if you don't, that doesn't necessarily mean that the animal isn't suffering. They could still be experiencing poor welfare. It just doesn't happen to be manifested in stereotypic behavior. As for the lifetime welfare score to improve it, future work can assess monkeys appraisal of each life event via cognitive bias test to then as, add as weights to the life event when creating the composite score. So that could be one way to improve that, improve it as right now is a bit maybe too simplistic. And yeah, I just wanted to thank the monkeys, the primate facilities, the primate technicians, the collaborators there, the funders, and my advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, so much for your presentation. I certainly learned a lot and welcome anybody who has questions to type them in the chat box and we will get, get to them. And so just to get us started, why do you think that the locomotor stereotypic behaviors just really weren't showing up as good indicators for lifetime welfare? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know what makes it so prone to false negatives. So it could just be that animals are doing something else and not stereotypic behavior when experiencing a negative affect. Um, they could either, we tested the hypothesis that, that animals not performing stereotypic behavior could possibly be displaying hunch postures, but that hypothesis wasn't proven. Um, so just because other work, especially in my show bot, um, there's kind of like two phenotypes to, 
aversive housing. So animals either become super active and perform stereotypic behavior or they, they can possibly become inactive. Um, but unfortunately, the inactive hypothesis uh, I didn't show in this talk wasn't met either. So yeah, but in other species and mice, you'll find that if the animal isn't stereotypic behavior, they're usually so doing some type of inactive behavior. Great, thanks for that, Andrea. Lisa asks, can you talk a bit more about your observational data collection? For example, the amount of time, the days of week, were the monkeys on a on study and a different study, et cetera? And how were the animal um, rooms chosen? Yes, so I'll start with the rooms. So um, the, the rooms were chosen opportunistically. So it wasn't random, they weren't randomly picked. And the reason because of that was um, at primate, the primate facilities that I was at, there's always a deep cleaning schedule, I think every two weeks. So deep cleaning means that the monkeys will be placed in new temporary cages, and then their old ones get washed in a big uh, washing machine. So I didn't want that to affect their behavior because it's very stressful, like they're going to be moved to a new temporary cage. And um, I remember it's actually quite loud uh, when that happens. So their behavior is definitely affected. So I wanted um, their behaviors to be undisturbed as possible to try to get their behaviors on days. Yeah, I just wanted to get what how they act normally and normally in a laboratory setting. Um, and I also made sure that the monkeys I observed weren't part of an active project because again, um, depending on if they were part of another study that could have also affected their behavior. So the monkeys I chose in the end weren't part of an active study and they were pretty much left undisturbed for the week that I saw them. So I observed rooms for four or five consecutive days. And for the time of year that I saw them, I think it was during early spring. Um, and Sorry, I'm just reading the question. Yes, yeah, so it was two hours before afternoon feeding and two hours after afternoon feeding for five, four consecutive days at each facility. Thanks, Andrea. Sarah says, thank you for your very interesting talk, Andrea. I was a bit surprised that you expected a positive relationship between locomotory stereotypic behavior and hair plucking, if I understood correctly. Since I would expect different motivations underlying the behavior, I actually learned that hair plucking is a compulsive disorder rather than a stereotypic behavior going along with different pathways in the CNS. Can you elaborate a bit more on your prediction? Thank you. Yeah, no, I didn't find a positive relationship between locomotor stereotypic behavior and hair plucking. What I found was a positive relationship between the lifetime welfare score and um, hair plucking, but sorry if I missed said something earlier. So basically I do have work that is under review right now in another journal where we looked at the relationships between different behaviors and we found that hair plucking actually wasn't plausibly associated with any other stereotypic behavior or any other abnormal behavior, which is why we categorized it alone for this particular study. And I totally agree with you, there's different motivations underlying each abnormal behavior. So yeah, I, I totally agree that hair plucking is um, probably a compulsive disorder, especially when you look at the human literature of hair pulling disorder. Um, yeah, I, that's all I have to say for that question. <laughs> yeah. Lisa says, if the monkeys were not part of an active study, the percentage that were singly housed is much higher than what has been reported in the literature. Any idea why the percentage was so high? Yeah, so it definitely was higher in one facility than another. So how it's done in the US is technically are not supposed to be singled housed. But there are exceptions to this and the exceptions are um, either pair housing couldn't be attainable because the monkeys just weren't suitable for pair housing, either probably to do with an aggressive aggression issue or because um, researchers who were using them um, preferred them to not, like they get some experimental exception. So either you can't pair house them because of a, they're not compatible or because they have an exemption due to a particular project. So I, 
I don't really know why that one facility had higher percentage than the other. I don't really know what was, I can't speak for them on behalf of like why they had it so high. Um, I just know that there are exceptions that people can say to keep, to have animals single housed. Great. Beerta says your welfare score was composed of events spanning from very aversive one to least aversive zero. Were positive experiences non-existent or not included? Yeah, that's a great question. So I had, I think, three positive life events, uh, one being late maternal, being having a late age of separation from the dam, being outdoor mother reared, and just spending time outdoors. But I have the problem with this data set is that outdoor housing, oh yeah, now I remember, outdoor housing and pair housing, um, which were established as positive life events, are the reciprocals of the negative events, indoor housing and single housing. Um, so for that one, I couldn't, like, I couldn't use both because they're the reciprocals of each other. So they would be included in twice. So to avoid that, I just picked the negative life events. But you're totally right. Like, um, in the end, that score is really only telling about cumulative suffering. It's not telling you about positive life events. And I think in part of that reason, it's just, it's, it's, at the beginning of this whole project, it's really hard to think of positive welfare events for laboratory monkeys, but we did come up with four and for maternal separation, age and rearing. Yeah, outdoor mother rearing was given a score of zero, uh, least aversive, even though I define that as a positive life event. Um, I'm gonna think about that one more. You definitely brought up a good point, whoever that person was. Thank you for <laughs> mentioning that. Yeah, that was from beer time. Rick says, I really appreciated your thorough and varied data analysis approaches and your main take home messages were strong. A challenge with data like this though, is that you will inevitably find some relationships and some go against what you expect, etc. And when you get into the weeds like this, it's hard to know how robust and repeatable the findings are after one study. I think it's a case of where a repeat of this work using almost identical methods, but at, at other primate facilities would be the best way to show that your results are robust and generalizable. Do you or others have a plan to repeat this work that you know of? Not me, I'm graduating this summer, Woohoo! but <laughs> jokes aside, uh, <laughs> thank you for the question and comment. Uh, yeah, no, you totally have valid points, repeatability, um, Replica replication, and I think that would be really valuable if someone could, yeah, could replicate these findings, especially as with the life event records, like those are always going to be at the facilities. You would, I can definitely see someone else in the future kind of just updating the life event records that I have up until the first day of whenever they decide to collect data. Oh, wait, but they, it'd be more sense if that was at a different kind of facility. Basically, yes, it's possible, but no, I don't know anybody that's going to plan to do that, but it's definitely possible at any primate facilities because these events typically are logged into a computer, like a digital management system, so it's definitely possible. Alka says, thank you for your very interesting presentation, Andrea. Picking up on the matter of single housing of monkeys, do you know what the situation is in Canadian laboratories? Uh, for single housing, oof. <laughs> no, and that's because the CCAC, uh, the, the Canadian national body that regulates uh, laboratory animals isn't transparent. So the most I can tell you is how many primates are in can, Canadian funded universities because that's all that the CCAC reports. I wouldn't be able to give you a number of how many of these animals are single housed and that's a problem with the transparency of regulatory bodies um, at the federal level in Canada, unfortunately. So yeah, I don't even I don't even know what the answer to that would be. I don't know if it's high, I don't know if it's low. Yeah, it's a great question though, Akraj, thank you. Uh, another question in case more people are working on typing in the chat box. You mentioned the positive welfare events, though so they're outside, they're mother reared, et cetera. And to me, it seems like it fits nicely into the, na the natural living concept of animal welfare. And so for monkeys, do you think looking to nature can sometimes improve their welfare? 
Yeah, no, that's a great observation. Thank you for uh, noticing that. So yeah, exactly. That's why um, that was kind of one of the reasons I justified outdoor housing being outdoor rearing as a positive life event is because um, just going back to human literature, there's just so much work in humans that spending time with nature or spending time outdoors is positively correlated with well-being. Um, and yeah, I was able to kind of just take that assumption and use it for non-human primates. But a lot of people that you talk to that work with lab monkeys um, will agree that the more nat naturalistic that their housing is, the better it is for their welfare. Um, yeah, that's an interesting observation. Great, thank you. It doesn't look like there are any more questions in the chat box. So I will go ahead and stop the recording, but um, I'll leave, leave the meeting up in case people do type in questions. But thank you, Andrea. Thank